Hey y'all, welcome. Welcome back to Inner Stage Window, my Saturday stream, which I always stream with friends. And today I have here with me Landon. Say hi, Landon. Hi, Landon. <laughs> I have missed everybody so much. It's been oh. two whole weeks. Two weeks without you guys is too many weeks. <laughs> I was like, what day? Because I also am not currently teaching. So I was like, what day of the week is it? Is that? I don't even have stream to keep me, to keep me sane anymore. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's too ridiculous. For me, it feels like no time at all because we spent the time moving. So it's just kind of mm. like um the time was like boom but for you guys i know it was for freaking ever and welcome in koneko i see you got first oh my gosh you're here with us for a saturday stream i hope that's for um fun reasons and not because uh your horse riding got canceled or something like that oh you were at a con oh you'll have to tell me about what con you went to um and if you bought merch and stuff take pictures and yes sailor moon we're gonna be talking about sailor moon so landon before we get started um tell everybody a little bit about sailor moon what we're going to be talking about. Well, we, well, I should say, uh, Karen is a very large anime fan, uh, <laughs> as we know. And we know that part of this show is her actually just bullying me to watch anime. Trying uh, to make Landon a once, weeb. <laughs> yeah, she did it once with Cowboy Bebop. Mm -hmm. And I was like, it's fine, I guess. And then she was like, what can I really do to hook you in? And I was like, you know what I used to love as a kid? Sailor Moon. And then she's like, did you know they did a reboot? And I was like, say less. And so <laughs> here we are, dissecting Sailor Moon Crystal, the reboot that's available on Netflix, uh, and that also premiered in Japan on TV. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it'll be, I was like, oh, Sailor Moon, there's a lot of things from my childhood and growing up. And the fact that they rebooted it, that's a good thing to look into. Yes. So we are going to talk all about it. So before we kind of um, get into it, I just want to remind everybody that Inner Stage Window is not a spoiler-free podcast. We're going to talk about things and stuff, and and uh, and we assume that you watched Sailor Moon as a kid the way that we did. We're assuming that you have either seen Crystal or you don't care about spoilers. So um, so yeah. But we are going to be focusing for like on season years. one. Yeah. I mean, yeah. It's been out. For, even the Crystal's been out for a while at this point. Um, but uh, we're going to be focusing on season one, so that's what we're going to really be talking about. And yeah, let me switch over so that you guys can see our beautiful um, PowerPoint. Here we go. Oh, look at that. Um, look wow. At oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> fancy font. Yes. Oh my gosh. So Koneko, that sounds like so much fun. Fun local, um, local cons are, are kind of, uh, they're, they're really fun. And they are starting to come back now that people are kind of like over the pandemic a little bit. So I'm so glad you were able to go. Um, and that quote is perfect for Esper. <laughs> um, but yes, Sailor Moon was also a big part of my childhood. Um, I watched it on Toonami. If you have not seen our Cowboy Bebop episode, you can go back and watch that where we talk a little bit about how anime um, came over to the West in the sense of where it got popularized. And we talked about Toonami and Adult Swim and some of those sorts of things. And uh, yes, and Sailor Moon was a big part of that. So that came over with like uh, Dragon Ball Z was like the boy show and Sailor Moon was like the girl show. I watched both, of course, because like gender norms can fuck off. Um, so I watched a lot of Sailor Moon uh, and was super, super into it. I bought all the mangas, you know, so um, it was a really, really big part of my childhood. And, and I think that from this episode and some of the things that we talk about, you're going to kind of see a little bit of why. Yeah. Um, Usagi annoys me so I can never get into it. Oh, okay. Koneko, you have to tune in for our season two talk then. We're going to talk a little bit about that part of the show, uh, Usagi's personality. <laughs> justice, justice for Usagi, kind of. Not really. She is annoying. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but you have to come back for season two. We're, we are going to talk about more of that in season two. Yes. It should be but next now we're going to talk about season. Yeah, should be next week. But right now we're going to talk about season one. So we love to start, of course, with um, favorite things. Right, Landon? Yes, favorite things. So, Karen, what is your favorite thing of Sailor Moon? Okay, so my favorite thing for this week is Sailor Venus. Now, when it comes to Sailor Moon, a big part of the beginning of Sailor Moon, which is really what takes place during season one of Crystal, is kind of setting up all of the characters and, uh, and creating these like 
this amazing idea of um, of a play sets, right? So a really good kids show, what it really does is it gives the kids a framework to imagine um, a game or imagine some play that takes place on the playground or in their home or things like that. Sailor Moon, absolutely excellent at doing this because you get a character for each planet and they all represent like different personality types. And um, I, of course, had to be like the cool second in command, um, already been doing this for a, a while, uh, you know, going to teach them like how to do the things. Uh, Sailor Venus. OK, Minako I know Sailor Venus, my favorite character, the very first character I ever role played in fandom role play when I started getting into that on like Yahoo chat rooms and AOL chat rooms and uh, and things like that back in the 90s. Uh, Sailor V, Sailor Venus, Minako, I would, all the versions of her, whatever, favorite character, I would roleplay her. I just thought she was the freaking coolest. I thought she had the coolest attacks. Um, I remember even like being upset that she had the lamest color palette and how her Sailor V color palette was way better. And why did she get gimped like that? Because she's the best character. Oh my God. Because <laughs> she does. Okay. It's like blue and orange. It looks like school colors. What the heck? <laughs> She's a good school girl. (laughs) (laughs) Something, something. Something. Um, And in the original anime, of course, there's lots and lots of filler episodes. And so there's a lot that goes into her personality as far as like she was very boy crazy. She was very unapologetic in the things that she enjoyed. She was um, happy to to be a girly girl, but also um, kind of refused to, uh, to commit to certain girly girl things. There was always like, uh, little tensions and 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 like a special friendship between her and um, Makoto Sailor Jupiter, who was the actual girly girl, even though she didn't look like it, and no one thought she was at first. She was the actual girly girl. So um, I thought there was like something interesting going on there that she got from the original anime with all the filler episodes. So just I just love this character. She's the best. She just she's also so extremely comfortable with herself not only yes. like, in her femininity and masculinity but also just like who she is as a person whereas like you have everybody else who struggles a little bit mm-hmm. especially compared to Usagi who like physically looks similar to her uh that there's like this a lot of insecurity with the other girls but then you have you have Sailor Venus who just comes in and is like no we're all badasses yeah it's like she's like (laughs) all right everybody don't worry someday you're gonna be on my level like that's what she comes in like (laughs) it's wonderful Mm -hmm. I love her so favorite thing favorite character um uh you know playground time I always had to be Sailor Venus right I was role-playing as Sailor Venus so that was uh, Sailor Venus oh my god so that was like uh that was my character i was here for her and so long as she was featured in the show i was going to be happy right so love the sailor venus episodes that's my favorite as long as we got more of her that's right (laughs) (laughs) so landon what is your favorite thing well back before i was out of the closet i had an aesthetic appreciation for the most dramatic character in this show and that's tuxedo mask uh what more would a young queer woman want than a man who shows up mysteriously in a full fucking tuxedo with a mask banters with the main character and then disappears into the night i don't know (laughs) this is what i wanted i loved it so much Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) i would say tuxedo mask was definitely early anime crush for multiple of my friends. I can remember multiple of my friends getting absolutely freaking obsessed with especially um, Dark Tuxedo Mask when he gets mind controlled towards, and that in Crystal that takes place towards the end of season one, but in the anime, the uh, 90s anime, it's like a whole like 10, 20 episodes. Yeah, it's like ridiculous. It's like 10, 20 episodes, something like that arc where he continues to be mind controlled during that time and everybody thought that was just like the hottest shit we were like losing our minds over him we we want apparently young teenage girls in the 90s early 2000s wanted a hot mysterious man 
who is forced to do terrible things, but underneath feels really bad for it. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Amazing. Nothing like women today. <laughs> Nothing. There's not that in every media possible. Not at mm-hmm. all. And the wonderful thing about Tuxedo Mask also is he's so memeable in the original 90s anime because there's so many filler episodes. It's all he almost feels like he's a character that does nothing, which is not true in the manga, not true in Crystal, but in the original anime, because there's so much filler, he does absolutely fuck all nothing for like the longest stretch of time in the in the anime. <laughs> Especially because the anime, I feel like, is really trying to be like hype the girls up. And then if we had mm-hmm. a guy come in and be useful every single time, uh, you really lose that. So it's like mm-hmm. a balancing sort of thing. And because there's so many filler episodes, it's like, okay, this man does nothing. Mm-hmm. My work here and is done, but you didn't do why anything. I love him. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly, Koneko. That meme is perfect. I love it. Um, and uh, and I do I do love Tuxedo Mask. The actual, what I would consider like the canonical version of him and how he's presented in the um, manga and things like that, as well as the anime version of him and how they end up necessitating a need to his character to make it still work for the themes of the show. Thank you so much for the Lurk Tap. We absolutely love our lurkers here. So thank you very, very much for doing that. So I- I'm I'm so glad you picked Tuxedo Mask for a favorite thing because honestly, second favorite character. <laughs> Truly everything I love about a man. <laughs> you have a ghost in your house, Landon. Your your door yeah, is open. The cat. He's, yeah, meow. He's, I heard him. He's meowing. I heard the ghost sound. Meow. I know. Yeah, there baby. He goes. Oreo's he's, back he's, there on the on the love seat. If anybody wants baby so cam, cute. I can give him his own little circle. <laughs> So yeah, right. um, love Tuxedo Mask. Amazing. Sailor Earth, by the way, if anybody's ever like, where is Sailor Earth? Tuxedo Mask is Sailor Earth. If you didn't or, realize that as a kid. Or if you played uh, Sailor Moon LARP with me as a small child, I was Sailor Earth. I was his long lost sister. Uh, and come on now, what's more amazing than that? <laughs> I mean, that seems like something that Naoko would have written. So I think that's valid. I could so see her doing that. So yeah. I was like, whoa, the earth deserves a princess too. And mm-hmm. she feels bad about the fact that her brother is always leaving. Come on now. Perfect. Love her. <laughs> I was angry even in third grade. Mm-hmm. <laughs> All right. Shall we break into what Sailor Moon is about for those who are watching that, that don't have an automatic memory to the early 2000s or haven't mm-hmm. watched the Netflix uh, show recently? Yeah, so you can get it on Hulu as well. Depending on what region you're in, it might be Hulu or Netflix. Okay, so we're going to do a plot synopsis. This is an anime episode, so this is a very rare Karen plot synopsis. Um, I have been busy, so we're going to do this slightly from memory. So this is season one of Crystal. um, And season one of Crystal starts with Usagi waking up to realize that she is Sailor Moon. She does this with the help of a talking kitty cat named Luna. And together they form a friendship. Luna informs Usagi that she now has to go and awaken the other sailor scouts in search of the moon princess. Why they do not do not connect that Sailor Moon is the moon princess for several episodes, I do not know, but they don't. (laughs) Yes. Uh, Plot reasons. So in addition to having to reawaken the sailor scouts and find the moon princess, They also are tasked with protecting the legendary silver crystal, which throughout this first season, nobody knows where the heck in heck the legendary silver crystal is. Um, It is a mystery. It has been lost, but it is one of the most powerful magical objects in the universe. So it's very important that they find it before the enemy, which is um, Queen Beryl. So Queen Beryl is the main antagonist of uh, most of season one. She has four generals that serve her. The four generals are all mind-controlled captives. Put a pin in that. We're going to talk about that later. And the sailor scouts are getting attacked by these uh, generals as Usagi is going around and waking everybody up. So first she wakes up Amy, who is Sailor Mercury. And uh, Sailor Mercury is like the smart one, okay? She is the strategist of the group. She is typically the one that holds the information or figures things out first um, or things of that nature. Next, she awakens Sailor 
Mars. Sailor Mars is Rey, and she is the spiritual heart of the group. So she is the one that is typically the most moral. She wants to be patient. She has um, these amazing uh, spiritual uh, and psychic powers. So she wakes up next. Oh, by the way, the way that Usagi starts her friendships with almost all of these girls, except Amy, but it starts with Rei, is she gets a little bit of a crush. And that's how you know it's going to be the next Sailor Guardian. <laughs> she has the biggest crush on Rei. Uh, they. Like, oh. Yes. <laughs> they wake in and she's like, oh, they make her heart feel things. And then she knows they're going to be a Sailor Scout. So they wake up right. Uh, next, they wake up uh, Sailor Jupiter, who is Makoto. She is very tall and um, and visually presenting very masculine, but she is actually the girly girl of the group. So if you can imagine like this um, very strong kickboxing woman um, whose passion in life is really just to sew and cook. So that is Makoto. They wake her up next. Uh, they are in search now of the final sailor scout, which they believe is going to be uh, the princess because they haven't found the princess yet. And they stumble upon Sailor V, who actually has been a sailor scout for much longer than the rest of them. She was awakened first, and she has a kitty cat named Artemis who helps her out. So they wake up Sailor V, that's Minako Aino, best girl, and Minako actually has a lot of information about what is going on with them. We learned that all of the girls have past lives where they were aliens living on the moon, and uh, in, in this kind of, the moon people live these like amazingly long lifespans, like hundreds or thousands of years, right? And there was all of this drama with the moon kingdom where it was taken out, there was this war and uh, they all uh, passed away. And now because the legendary silver crystal is being sought after by Queen Beryl, they all have to reawaken so that they can protect it once again, which is why they are all middle school students and so they're middle school students in this first season. Well, during all of this time that Usagi is going around and waking up the different Sailor Scouts, she is also having these interesting encounters with Mamoru Shibuya, who is a high school student that um, is in her same school district. So they, they end up bumping into each other quite a lot. And uh, she has this sort of interesting, like, maybe I am romantically interested in him. Maybe he's like just teasing me a lot and we're just friends. Like, I don't really know. Um, and she comes to find out that Mamoru Chiba is also the mysterious uh, tuxedo mask who has been showing up to try to help her out whenever enemies attack. And just like the Sailor Scouts, tuxedo mask also has been told he needs to find and protect the legendary silver crystal. So everybody's looking for the legendary silver crystal. The Sailor Scouts are looking for them. Tuxedo mask is looking for it. Um, Queen Beryl and her generals are looking for it. Everybody's looking for it. Well, towards the end, we find out that actually the legendary silver crystal was the friendships we made along the way all, the, all along. And uh, once Usagi and Mamoru fall in love for real this time, the legendary silver crystal comes out of Sailor Moon's body and it now exists in a physical form in the real world. We also find out that Queen Beryl actually um, is being manipulated by an Eldritch Horror. This is something you'll see a lot in Sailor Moon. And the Eldritch Horror this time is called Queen Metallia. And that is ultimately who really wants the legendary silver crystal. Queen Metallia is this really powerful Eldritch Horror being. She cannot get the, sil the legendary silver crystal or like the world will end as we know it. So everybody has to protect it from her. Well, for a while though, when the legendary silver crystal comes out of Usagi, Mamoru Chibia gets kidnapped. This happens a couple of times in Sailor Moon. He gets kidnapped by Queen Beryl and her generals. And so Usagi is heartbroken and the legendary silver crystal basically has no magical powers. It's just a rock until uh, they have a showdown fight where Tuxedo Mask fights the Sailor Scouts while he is mind controlled. Uh, eventually the mind control breaks. The legendary silver crystal's power is restored. Uh, the girls do like these amazing attacks. They defeat the enemy and everything is good for now. There is no more evil. The legendary silver crystal is in possession 
of the Sailor Scouts and um, Usagi and Mamoru are officially dating together. End of season one. All right, guys, we are back. I have no idea if we fixed the audio issue. Um, we're going to find out. Uh, I never hear this on the VODs when I go back and listen to them. I know this is something that's popped up a couple of times from you guys, um, but I think it, it's maybe a Twitch problem because it only happens live. So I really don't know. I'm so deeply sorry, but we're going to move forward. If it's, if it's really bad, then it is what it is. And y'all are more than welcome to watch the VOD later. Um, so yeah. Okay. Go ahead, Landon, with what you were saying. I'm going to be honest. I don't remember what I was saying. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, let's move forward then to the next slide. All right. So uh, the worldwide takeover. So this is an important part of um, of Sailor Moon, and uh, that it it really hit Western media and exploded very quickly. Um, it was targeted to young women, where or young girls, I should say where and when it was targeted i mean that's kind of the magic of this original series so let's talk about that a little bit yeah so the magical girl genre yeah we can go ahead and show the next part of the slide landon the magical girl genre was very very popular um already in japan but then it came over to the u.s and just absolutely freaking exploded so it was the late 90s and Sailor Moon came to the West and to Toonami, and it just absolutely exploded. The original anime had so much filler in it that it just created this situation where you could skip a couple of episodes and still kind of know what was going on in Sailor Moon. Like we had a really um, interesting encounter with like, uh, certain parts of Sailor Moon, because we had both watched the original as kids and not really like sat down and binged it in order. It's like, wait, did that happen in the original? Oh, wait, yes, it did. <laughs> Specifically um, with an entire arc of the second season. We'll talk about that, that too. <laughs> yes. So so the original was just incredibly wildly popular. Um, it, it was like also a big fandom online because the internet was very young at this time. So there was just a ridiculous amount of like fan art and fanfic and things of that nature in regards to Sailor Moon uh, that really just took everyone by storm. And uh, do you remember, like, there was Sailor Moon merch. Like, who remembers those awful freaking dolls? Those, like, disgusting-looking <laughs> dolls that they had. But they were everywhere. Well, also, Hot Topic in the same era started taking its branding from being, like, more grunge goth punk to more nerd culture which is what it kind of exists in now and anime was really the first kind of foyer into that step forward and so there would be this like goth store that none of us were like at least where i grew up none of us were allowed to go into but sailor moon t-shirts presented right there in the front of the store that i just desperately wanted to have Yes. Um, for, for a while, uh, Hot Topic was like, it was like grunge and emo and like goth and stuff like that. But then all of a sudden it was fandom um, and Sailor Moon was a big part of that. So yes, absolutely. It just, it was everywhere. It was just everywhere. No, and it was, it was amazing as far as like how it, it was my real first experience with fandom was watching um, Sailor Moon. Because I was very young, I was in elementary school when I first started watching it, and I had the privilege of like watching everything explode outside, outside of, of um, um, the, internet. the internet. Because, because things, things were just, were just around, around happening, happening at Hot Topic, topic in different, different stores, stores, I saw, I saw different, different people wearing things, things. In, a in a way, way that, that like, I was, I was old, old enough to understand, understand that, that was what, what Bam Bam was, was. and it, it was like, really my first foray into it, and it was everywhere. I'm so sorry, Koneko, because I can't hear it and I never hear it on the VODs, I don't think there's anything we can do. I think it's Twitch. Oops, it's Twitch. Um, it does seem that Landon having her mic really close to her mouth helps, but it's not fixing it. And I don't know how to fix it. I'm so sorry. All right. Next part of the slide. So yeah, when it came to Sailor Moon, um, it was just like, it was kind of a shock. I think nobody really knew what this like anime stuff 
was when it first came out. They were just kind of like, this is a little bit weird. Um, I remember a lot of, uh, of parents thinking it was quite strange compared to regular Western cartoons um, and things of that nature. So uh, so Sailor Moon was like uh, something that all the kids were into that the parents really didn't get. Like, this is nothing like our cartoons when we were a kid. You know, it's nothing like the, uh, the 80s cartoons that have been around for now a while. Um, this was like a whole brand new thing. Kind of, yeah, it was a whole brand new thing. And kind of like you were talking about it, like it, it, it also hit the sweet spot of expanding Cartoon Network tsunamis sort of branding to go from like cartoons that were directed towards a certain audience which was usually young boys to being able to be directed towards young girls and pull more viewerships in Mm -hmm. um and that helped it explode as well yes yeah it was a girl cartoon where they actually fought things yes (gasps) um and and then because of that it kind of inspired a whole genre of cartoons of girls fighting things yeah (laughs) Uh, which is I mean we might be stepping a little ahead of here but I think that that brings us to like the niche that it filled yeah I think it's next slide yeah there we go yeah my thing was being stupid of the magical girl yeah of the idea of this magical girl group of super powered wonderful women coming together kicking ass taking names all that kind of stuff yeah and Uh, and it really discovered the genre in media or it didn't discover it but it exploded it in in uh in american culture yeah in like western media like all of a sudden it magical girl wasn't just a thing that they had over in japan magical girl was something that we had in the west too so we've got a couple of examples here of shows that you look at them i mean these are from all from like slightly different time periods but if you look at them, they really all are very Sailor Moon-esque where there's like a group of girls and they all have like powers, but they're slightly different powers and they go and they fight things. So you've got Powerpuff yeah, Girls. They all have their color. Yes. They all have their power, their element, mm-hmm. um, their niche, and they go and they work together to fight things. There's usually a strong leader. There's usually a uh, more like aggressive type character that's really wise but super aggressive and then there's usually like a sweeter need to protect one Mm -hmm. Uh, and if you look at all of these you can point out which ones they are in all of those tropes (laughs) yes pretty much they're all kind of like color-coded right so we've got powerpuff girls winx club um disney's fairies is a huge uh um brand that they have a surrounding tinkerbell and then totally spy so those are our examples but if you think about it like I'm sure you can come up with lots of other examples of this really similar like girl team stuff. Whereas if you think about kind of the girl media before Sailor Moon got really popular, you think about things like um, My Little Pony, Care Bears. And I mean, I guess they sort of fight things on those shows, but like not like the post Sailor Moon shows. Okay, the post Sailor Moon shows, they kick ass a difference like the the way that the way that those shows are written how they're written it's almost like sailor moon woke up industry officials into being like oh girls want to be badasses too mm-hmm. like um the yeah we had care bears but i would even argue that care bears wasn't advertised to like the age that sailor moon was advertised it was advertised younger um and several other of those like young shows my little pony is a little different but as far as and even then i think my little pony you could argue is a magical girl group i mean it is kind of right it's just that <laughs> a magical in a in my little pony there's no real conflict like there's ever no, no. <laughs> not, not, not the new one but in the old my little ponies there is no real conflict <laughs> there is no real conflict no but what but what i mean is like it really did like fill in this gap of age where girls were between the like the middle school ages Mm -hmm. that they didn't have anything directed towards that group and demographic and then all of a sudden they did (laughs) Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yep so uh it as you can see the original 90s anime was much beloved um in the west like we just went absolutely bonkers for it so then After that, many years pass and Sailor Moon Crystal comes out. 
which is what we just watched. Yes. So there's a couple movie, like the big, the big arcs, a couple movies, and then it dies out. Because I, I also feel like anime in mainstream culture here in America kind of died out a little bit as well. Yeah. Well, it's there's other more popular than the yes. than, than it was before. But like I remember when Yu-Gi-Oh was like a main movie mm-hmm. in movie theaters, mm-hmm. and that's mm-hmm. not happening as much anymore. No, I mean anime is kind of it's more mainstream. There isn't like you know it's not the same. It's not the same as it used yeah. to be. Um, so, but so and there and we know that. that yeah, we know there's been like Sailor Moon stage plays and some other things like that. Uh, but none of these are like uh, none of these are like um, you know a, a show that everybody's going to watch. Hey, yes. thank you so much for the lurk, Jed. We love our lurkers here. There was a small decline in popularity mm-hmm. and a lull, and then suddenly. There was talk of a remake. Yeah. Well, you know, all the old Sailor Moon fans are about to, at the time they were make, remaking this are about to hit about 30 years old. This is a great time to remake something from their childhood, isn't Especially it? Especially because <laughs> they're going to have kids of their own. So it's mm-hmm. like a built in audience. What? Yes. Uh, which is fantastic ideas, except for the fact that everyone hated it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God. <laughs> freaking god okay so when this was first being discussed it was advertised as like going back to the original manga so we were like okay we're gonna go back to the manga we're gonna meet remake it from that and like when you watch say the season one of sailor moon crystal in a lot of ways it almost is like a panel by panel remake of the manga now there are some small differences that we're not going to go into because like, I just don't really care that much. Um, But everything that is in Sailor Moon Crystal either existed in the manga or was part of some other ideas that Naoko Takuchi, the author of Sailor Moon, had put out there into the world, right? So it was a very, very faithful, incredibly, ridiculously faithful. And here's the thing is when you make a remake that is that faithful, In a different medium, it loses a lot of the meaning because an anime is different than a manga. So, and the same thing happens in other mediums as well. When you like, you know, word for word, take a book and make it into a movie, they're awful because they are different mediums. When you are adapting something, it's very important to figure out what like the essence of that thing is, what the core of it is, and keep that. It's not important to keep exact lines of what people said. It's not important to keep things in exactly the same order that they happened in the original, right? What you're looking for is the same. You want it to make people feel the same way, okay? And Crystal doesn't do that. (laughs) I can kind of understand why some people, if they are not involved in fandom, don't realize that like that's the thing Mm -hmm. because so many people i'm going to use the harry potter fandom for example will be like well they changed this line and it's like okay you're not really angry about the line that changed you're angry about the essence and that feeling and the tone that changed but most people in fandom verbalize that as the line so then people who are remaking things go oh we just need to use the exact same lines no if I wanted you to use the exact same lines, I'd watch the original, first mm-hmm. of all. <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> I, and second of all, you're missing the point. You're missing about what made this special. Uh, and and going panel by panel, you could just read the manga. Yeah. Yep, you could. And this is the thing, is we thought we were going to be getting this more faithful adaptation. And kind of what the fandom collectively realized is... There was a lot of value in those filler episodes. Um, and uh, and you there is a website where you can go and look up like which episodes are filler of different anime. So here's just a screenshot at the very beginning. And you can see within the first 27 episodes, we've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 30, 40, 15, 16, 17. Um, 17 of those 27 episodes are considered filler, um, like complete filler, not just like mostly filler in some canon or anything like that, but just total complete filler. And what you're able to do with those filler episodes is really develop the characters' personalities and their motivations and really 
give each of the different Sailor Scouts um, more meat to their character. You know, meat that's not really necessary in the manga because so much can be conveyed by like the order of the panels and exactly what's drawn because it's really stylized in the manga. But in the anime, it's not like that because you've got movement in there. So you need those filler episodes to help people kind of make those connections to the characters. And um, in Crystal, there is no filler whatsoever. You couldn't remove a damn thing from a single episode. If you did, it wouldn't make any sense. Um, it is completely like, exactly. the, yeah, it need to know. Sense. And um, you also like, that's what being an anime brings to the table. Mm -hmm. That's what it really like is that you are able to expand and have the ability to tell a different story than what necessarily exists in the manga or manga that you have the ability to continue to like expand on not only your characters, like you were saying, but also just explore different things because it takes years or six months usually to publish and draw a manga but it takes just a few days if you need to to draw an episode because of the technology that's available and how the systems work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, Not anime days, is typically but, produced. You know yeah, but anime is typically produced much faster than manga. We know this because usually anime adaptations start in the middle of when a manga is very popular and it's still being written. And so you end up having to do a lot of filler so that the manga can catch up. So that's very, very common. So yes, absolutely. Um, and that's part of why people like like it. That's why people would go and watch the show and not just read the manga. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, uh, absolutely. And, and you kind of, you lose, you lose that. And I think that on shows that are older and because they're anime versus uh, American television, um, American television doesn't have as much, especially since the early 2000s, doesn't have as much filler mm -hmm. like even if you're looking at shows like Buffy Buffy is still is quintessential 2000s kind of show of, how, of there are filler episodes that exist within there but for the most part there is something of every episode that is plays into the overall story so if you mm -hmm. needed to miss two episodes you, you, you usually be okay uh, but there are things that happen that are important to the story Yep. And I think with, isn't like that at all. No, yeah. and with American television, it's a little bit different, right. right? Because we do have a lot of like filler episodes in comedy shows and sitcoms and things like that, but those shows are designed specifically so they do not have to be watched linearly. And they're typically not adapted from something else. They're typically whole cloth created as a show, whereas animes are typically adapted from manga. They're not typically created whole cloth as an anime. So we have like a little bit of a different mechanism going on there, um, why you see these big differences here. So when you have an American audience that is used to a lack of filler, it's easy to look back at something that has a lot of filler to sit there and be like, oh, how can this improve? Take out the filler. But you don't realize until it's gone how much it meant. <laughs> yeah. And this wasn't the only thing that people were really upset about with the remake. There was a huge gap in animation quality. So we have a screenshot here um, that, uh, Selena, if you could bring that up. Yep, it's going. My computer's okay. just being silly. Okay, so we've got a screenshot here uh, that you can see the original air, like on TV release on the left and the fixes that they did on the right. I want to call your attention especially to the janky ass eyes, what the fuck, especially in that one. Yes. Also, all of the shadows in the original are like so lazy and fake looking, whereas the um, shadow and lighting in the other ones actually look like, oh, that's kind of like a stylized version of what it would actually look like in reality. What the heck? Um, it was just bad. Like it was bad. It was rushed. And, and when you watch it, the originals, you're kind of like, what the fuck kind of cash grab bullshit is this? They just made this because they knew people would watch it because they called it Sailor Moon. They didn't care. There was no heart. Like, that's what people are saying. Because when you look at that bad animation, what other assumption are you supposed to come to? Exactly. And, and that's kind of what it was. It was a cash grab. It was way to get relevant again. Um, I, a part of me wonders if behind the scenes, it was very much like, 
oh, they won't notice, they don't care. Or if it was like a, hey, we have a ridiculous due date by this, so we need to cut corners where we can. Uh, because we sold Netflix six months to make a 12, 20 episodes, right? Like if, if that was kind of what was happening, then it's like, okay, they care about qual- qual- quantity and getting it out more than they do about quality, which really kind of shows the fans that the priority is making money, kind of like mm-hmm. you were saying, it's a cash grab. Yeah, and in in the anime industry, this is a huge problem. And so most likely they were given deadlines that were impossible, goals that they couldn't possibly meet. Um, I'm sure that 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 was a huge factor. And there was some serious salt in the wound too, because around the same time this remake was getting started, Dragon Ball Super was getting started, which was a remake of, um, of the Dragon Ball franchise. You know what? It wasn't panel by panel. It was like, they totally changed things and and made it different and uh, and gave you new things to be interested in. Their animation was great. So we were like, why the heck does the boy show get all this love and attention and the girl show gets garbage mismatched eyes? What? Like it was just really that first season was just really disappointing um because of that. Now, all of that being said, I would say that the hate is a little unwarranted. When you go back and binge the whole thing, and now also that the other seasons are out, it's still good, you guys. And there's people on the internet, especially in a lot of these like YouTube video essay videos, will say things like, don't introduce someone to Sailor Moon via Sailor Moon Crystal. Hard disagree, okay? Sailor Moon Crystal is an excellent way to be introduced to Sailor Moon because it doesn't have the filler and because it is an anime, which is a format that more people are familiar with versus reading the manga, right? Um, It's not going to have all that filler that's going to bore people like the original anime. Um, Other great introductions are also what I would consider more short forms of Sailor Moon. If you can get a recording of certain stage plays, excellent introduction to Sailor Moon. And Sailor Moon Crystal, I think, is an excellent introduction for the same reason. It packs everything into this very compact um, little package that is easy to consume, easy to understand. And you know what Sailor Moon Crystal still does? It still does the most important thing a piece of media can do. Entertain you and make you wonder what's going to happen next. I was going to say, as somebody who doesn't consume a lot of anime, who, who, when I am watching something, my first priority is not animation. I didn't even notice this stuff, right? Like, like certainly if you had a couple, if you had someone who's like really, really focused on the artwork, who like enjoyed that aspect of me, of the medium, of course, they're going to point this out, but the funky shadows, the weird eyes, it's frames sometimes and it's like okay some of it is it's fine like this is just how it be uh and from the I feel like the average viewer not someone entrenched in the fandom it's not even noticeable like it's not high on the list of things to notice I think that's true and I think that's fair so those out there wanting to get a friend into Sailor Moon or if you have never watched Sailor Moon before and you'd like to get into it as you can see the blu-ray releases much, much better quality animation. So you can go on Hulu, um, which is a, where it is right now, at least in the US, that's the easiest way to place to get it is Hulu. Um, and uh, and you can watch it. And it is a really great introduction to Sailor Moon. And I think even from the first season, you can understand why people loved it so much, why women loved it so much, and why um, little girls loved it so much. I also think that it's important to talk about the fact that it was trying to win a losing battle Mm -hmm. right out the gate because and I know that this is not a fandom episode but we got to talk about it when people are trying to remake something they will always lose always so it's like the idea of expectations versus results when it comes to a pre-exist a fandom with a pre-existing uh, or a a media with a pre-existing fandom, it's never, no matter what, going to live up to what the fandom wishes it would be. Mm-hmm. It doesn't matter if it's Sailor Moon. It doesn't matter if it's Harry Potter, Disney, 
Game of Thrones, if it's Veronica Mars, like it doesn't matter. People are not, it is not going to be what they want it to be because what people want versus what they're going to get it, it's never going to line up mm-hmm. and you do you remember do you remember like in the harry potter fandom when the movie started coming out and if you look back on it now when you think that those are actually examples of really excellent adaptations where they did an amazing job but if you remember when those movies were coming out it was nothing but bitching it was nothing yeah. but bitching so nothing. it's the same it's the same. So I'm looking, we're talking about Sailor Moon Crystal several years after it came out. It's not 2015 anymore, yada, yada. So we're looking back at it um, with fresh eyes. And uh, and so we're able to say like, actually, it's not that bad. Actually, it's a great introduction for new people. And But in 2015, 2016, when this was first coming out, no one, no one said that. No one said that it was god awful. Also, they hated it. I also feel like it helps that we have, like in this particular conversation, we have one person who isn't entrenched in the fandom and another person who can separate their feelings from that stuff. There are still people who hate Sailor Moon Crystal mm-hmm. because of all these reasons mm-hmm. and will never watch it because of it. Mm-hmm. Uh, just like there are people who will never watch House of Dragons from Game of Thrones or any of the Disney remakes, right? Um, yep. That same thing of like, I'm going to hate it no matter what it is. And they, or worse, they will watch it and then hate it no matter what it is. <laughs> I watch these, at these, this point, I'm so jaded against these things. I, I watch them for you guys, okay? I watch them so I can tell you what I think. I do not, Actually, I mean, I'm so done. I'm probably not watching House of Have the Dragon. It, this, it looks awful. I'll, not I'll into watch it. it because Matt Smith's in it. And also because I'm trying to convince Garen to do a Game of Thrones for this. We'll see. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and I, hot take. I know we've talked about this and it's off topic, but I actually don't mind most of the Disney remakes. Two of the ones that we've chosen on this board suck, uh, but the other two are actually really entertaining. (laughs) I'll let you guess which one it is. Or better yet, (laughs) go watch our ranking remakes. Yes, you can go watch our our ranking remakes episode. We also have an episode on Mulan specifically, which you should definitely go watch. Yes. Anyway. Um, so I why do, why do they keep doing this, Landon? Let me ask why? you. That. Why do they? Why? Money, prestige. Money, money, money. Uh, people who create things all of a sudden realize that fandom is fickle and will eventually think that they aren't uh, unless they continue producing that they aren't worth the attention. Uh, and so they feel like that they have to continue to produce things in order to fill the vo- void inside their soul that marketing took mm-hmm. my my personal my personal belief <laughs> mm-hmm. yep not not based off of any sort of bitterness or anything <laughs> yes koneko has another good point so this was the other point we wanted to bring up with the why retaining copyright is a big part of it um if you don't touch an ip like long enough then you lose the ability to fight for it so if somebody were to use it and you were to take them to court the court could very easily say like well you hadn't been using it so you lose it um, so you have to touch your IP every so often, or you lose your rights to it. Um, I am not familiar with IP law in Japan, so I'm not even going to pretend yeah. like anime has the same IP reasons. Uh, I because I don't freaking know. Someone in the comments, you tell me if you know about gonna, IP law in Japan. But in the US, that is absolutely true. That. It is true, but I'm also going to argue part of that uh, for some of the things on here. Um, being Disney, Disney is doing fine in all four of these movies as far as their IP goes. They're continuing to sell merch. They're continuing to hold copyright because of the parks, uh, all of that kind of stuff. And so I feel like that that isn't, it is a motivator to some aspects, but I don't think it is as big a motivator as like being willing to spend millions of dollars to recreate something. Yeah. But you know what? Being willing to spend millions of dollars to make millions of dollars. Yes. But you know what? I'm waiting for, I think it's Gen Alpha, whatever it's called after Zoomers. I'm waiting for Gen Alpha to get to be like age 25 and make um, the next uh, YouTube video essay saying that, uh, you know, Lion King live action remake is good, actually. And here's why. You know, I cannot wait for that video. (laughs) Girl, there are videos. There are videos about why the Cars franchise is good. And let me be clear, it's not. Hold on. The Cars franchise, first of all, is amazing only the first one they're they're awful okay landon they're awful they're not Neither, good. 
Vader itself deserves its own theme park. I mean, that's fine. You know, maybe we should do an episode on cars because I'm a big old cars <laughs> hater. I have a big old hate boner for cars. I, I only like the no, first one. No, I just, I heard you have an, a, an opinion that I felt like I should disagree with. And I'm, so now <laughs> I'm just dying on this hill. I actually have zero opinion on this. I was just like, I want to be argumentative. I do cars that is entertaining. a lot, people. <laughs> cars is entertaining. That is a neutral statement. <laughs> That is neutral. Hey, I want to continue this fighting. Let's keep going. <laughs> All right. But no, we'll get back on to Sailor Moon. Yeah. So they, they keep trying um, to do this. There's there's IP reasons. Um, it's motivated but, by capitalism, of course. I mean, you know, uh, and the whole reason that the IP laws exist the way they do is because of capitalism. So basically, we're just mm-hmm. capitalism. That's the reason we blame it for everything. Mm-hmm. I also think, I mean, I also think there is some ego attached to it, right? Like... I mean, we'll be on here, and I know that this exists in other places, but Harry Potter and Fantastic Beasts and Where to Find Them certainly was money motivated on the studio's aspect. But JKR went out and tried to write things that were not found favorable, and she needed to feed that I am loved and be loved uh, sort of beast inside of her that power mm-hmm. creates. And so created something in the fandom she knew was going to be instantly successful because it exists within the fandom. Yeah, and I do think and it is tough to be a creative person and to realize that you made one thing that's popular and you're never going to make a thing that's popular again. Oh, yeah. Um, so I do kind of sympathize with that feeling and the desire to continue to return to that one popular world over and over. Being Being an artist sucks because you spend most of your life trying to find success. And then once you find it, you spend most, most of the rest of, the rest of your, of your life, life losing success. success. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like, like, there, there is, is, there is no, no good cycle, cycle or position to be in that cycle, cycle mm-hmm. at all. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, 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 it's terrible and awful. And awful. Uh, but, but when people, people are stuck, stuck in it, it, they continue, they continue to do things like things like the world. world. And they will fail time and time, time again, again and not, not give them what they need, need or want, want because, because they're not doing, doing what it is that is being asked for because what is being asked for is impossible. Mm-hmm. Yes. It is impossible. That is why fandom exists. exists. Fandom, fandom exists, exists because, because there is a ravenous need among fans, fans that, is that is not enough. enough. And if you, you try, try to see the angry beast, you're just going to get your hand cut off. That's true. Yeah. Like, like it's, it's, it can it be your best, best friend, friend fandom, but it is also, also every, every creator's worst nightmare. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and you kind of have to just ignore it. it. Because if you defeat it, it you're done. You've you lost control. control. <laughs> yep. And it's not your art anymore. So, yeah. It's not yours. Sad. But anyway, <laughs> uh, before we get to themes, though, we're going to talk about themes. But before our themes, we're going to hear a word from our sponsor. Uh, which is who can audible interstage window is sponsored by audible you can start your 30-day free trial on audible using this link it is audibletrial.com slash interstage window you get 30 days free and you help out the show a little bit so we would absolutely love to have your support via an audible trial it is a service that i have used several times and do enjoy so i actually can like legit recommend it um do we have a Yes. Do we have a recommendation for this week? Do. It's kind of hard to see. All right. Cinder. Uh, So I have definitely recommended this book before. It is Cinder by Marissa Mayer, but it kind of fits into our magical girl theme. So I was like, man, need to just put this this YA book through one more time. It is a sci-fi fantasy futuristic dystopian retelling of Cinderella, where instead of being a uh, down and out orphan Cinderella is actually a fucking cyborg uh, and is awesome. <laughs> uh, she and Rapunzel, uh, Little Red Riding Hood, and uh, the Big Bad Wolf, and several others. Oh, and of course, Snow White, forgot about her for a second, all team up to take down an evil queen who is destroying the earth and willing to ruin the entire empire. Uh, and also fighting a disease plague thing while doing it. It's fucking phenomenal. One of my favorite YA series. And you got that magical girl teamwork sort of vibe. So if you like, if you like Sailor Moon, you'll definitely like this. Did you There's know? There's a Moon Kingdom there too. Oh, <laughs> fabulous. Did you know 
that in an original draft of Sailor Moon before it was published, Amy, the Sailor Mercury, was a cyborg. I did not know. I love that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Makes a lot of sense for her character. Yep, yep. It got ended ended up getting um changed, of course, in the version that actually came out to where instead of a cyborg, she just has the the visor that gives her a bunch of cool data. Um, but yeah, in an early early draft, she was actually a cyborg. I love that. It was like an android type character. So yeah, very cool. But yes, Cinder, we've recommended it a couple times. We're going to recommend it again because we do believe if you like Sailor Moon, you will like Cinder. The audiobook is next level. I love the actors on the audiobook. It's fantastic. Yes. All right. Let's get into themes. Everyone is sad. (laughs) So sad. Yes. All of the time. Mm -hmm. Man, like... I make a living off being sad. I truly do. I like to, they call me the angstmeister, all of my friends. Somebody should pay me for it. I just like making things sad all of the time. And I have a feeling it's because of Sailor Moon. (laughs) (laughs) That I was young enough when I watched it. Impressionable little child me watched all of these young women being sad all of the time. And it was like, this is what it's like to live in a world where you're special. (laughs) Mm -hmm. oh my god and it's it's like it permeates the beginning of sailor moon crystal absolutely permeates usagi she is introduced as this character who is um who just doesn't have her shit together okay she can't pass school she can't wake up on time um like the the only the positive depressed yeah she's low-key depressed um we have this that one of the very first scenes that we're introduced to her is she finds luna and um, and she she t- pulls the band aid off of Luna's like little scar thing, and then Luna smacks her in the face. <laughs> it's like this girl can't win. This girl can't win. And and uh-huh. she goes through meeting a series of friends that um, that just can't freaking win. Um, we've got this happens to Amy. This happens to Ray, and this happens to Makoto. They are all so freaking sad all the time over just the way that their life is. So um, Makoto is introduced as somebody that is like um, uh, bullied because she she's tall and strong and girls aren't supposed to be tall and strong. So everyone's scared of her and no one wants to be her friend. Amy, everyone's intimidated by her because she's so smart. Why does she need friends? She spends all of her time at cram school anyway. She ain't got time for friends. And then you have got Ray, who is incredibly troubled by her own spiritual power and premonitions that she has. She is not able to relax at any moment because of the spiritual abilities that she has. All of these girls, all of these girls were sad, sad sacks until they met Usagi. Yeah, and it's, and uh, it's interesting because I think it really does highlight an aspect of young girlhood which is the isolation of being a young of being a young woman if you aren't in the society like click of that it can be extremely le- lonely dealing with all of these themes uh but the fact that <laughs> this really is a like group of girls built on i'm different and no one will be my friend just means that the first like five episodes is depressing Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, especially without those fillers (laughs) especially without those fillers yeah I'm like this is the thing about Crystal though like if you are looking for a good time where you will feel happy this might not be the show for you at the beginning because all of that happy fun it works itself out friendship was with us all along that's in like the last three episodes yeah (laughs) nine episodes straight up isolation and mind control Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, (laughs) mm -hmm. yep and and all all of these girls basically like usagi like sees them across the way and says wow they're so cool and beautiful and it's like usagi's the very first person to have ever said that about any of them they are all like totally friendless totally sad um, have crappy home lives. Like, forget Just Makoto like doesn't even have any family. She doesn't even have yeah. parents or anything. She like literally lives by herself. 
Um, Ray, it's implied that she like kind of runs that shrine. Like it's no, it's she's never said that she doesn't have parents or anything. So we assume she has parents, but like no one else is ever at that shrine. I guess Wasn't she runs it by herself. I think she, if I remember correctly, she was raised by her grandfather in yes. the original. Yes. It wasn't in Crystal, but in the original. In the she's anime. Raised, she's raised. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. So it is like this aspect of like, it is extremely lonely. And until you find your group of people, you are isolated and alone. And then you find your group of people and it wakes you up. Mm-hmm. And I think that's a very like realistic experience for being a young woman yes. like there there is this feeling when you're a teenager and you're you're very hormonal and you're very like you know um emotional and attitudinal and like things when you're a teenager i mean if you remember like 15 and 16 like everything is more like everything feels like more than it is and so when your friends aren't around like you feel lonely in this very deep way and it doesn't take long for that to sink in um, now, this, of course, goes away as you're an adult, and then you're like, my God, please leave me alone. <laughs> Actually, but, I don't need to see you all the time. Yeah, you're but, fine. But as a kid, like, one weekend without your friends is, like, devastating. End of the world. Yes. Uh, and also because so much can happen in that weekend, too. Like, as far as, like, the, the constant moving of relationships between kids uh everything is fast paced and moving whereas things are a little slightly more cemented the older you get Mm -hmm. um and so it's like oh missing a weekend really does change the entire dynamic of how others perceive you Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. how your relationships are Mm -hmm. and sailor moon has this in spades and crystal i think this is one one of the parts of crystal that i actually think crystal does this better than any other version of sailor moon it hits that melancholy hard it is like it is like so heavy on your shoulders in a way that other versions of sailor moon just aren't as sad and for that reason i think crystal it still retains a lot of the core of what makes sailor moon so appealing to such a wide range of young women uh because it's the saddest version of sailor moon it really is and that like that longing to be something else and somewhere else and greater than you are like that melancholy for a life that these girls never lived like that's the other thing too that's really interesting as far as a theme goes is all of these girls have a melancholy for a thing that they themselves haven't experienced they just lived it in a past life Mm -hmm. um so it's like not even something that they can actually return to uh the only way that they can do it is to like recreate it instead of return. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's an interesting concept of like, no wonder they're so sad. The thing that they want to accomplish can't actually be accomplished. Mm -hmm. And they, and eventually it's implied that they get their memories back, but we never really see that. Like all we ever see is these glimpses of the, the past memories that they have of the moon kingdom. They never get to fully experience it. They only experience it in a form of nostalgia and that's it. That's all they ever get. it's also incredibly important to, to like through this is to separate like this the sailor guardians and the and the actual characters of who they are like there is a there is a separation because of the magical powers because of the transformation but also like recognizing that the history and everything like that happens to the sailor guardians Whereas the others are still trying to develop their relationship. And so even if they did get their real memories back, it doesn't change their existence in real life. Mm -hmm. They reiterate Uh, over and over. Yeah, I mean, they reiterate over and over with Usagi's character, but I'm still a middle school student, but I'm still Mm -hmm. a girl. Like there, there is no way to get out of that period faster. Yeah. And... And so, yeah, it, it is nice to like long for and to have community between these girls, but they're still struggling with it. And that isn't said as directly as it is with Usagi, mm-hmm. but it is said. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that is something that I think is incredibly powerful. Uh, and especially something incredibly powerful to give to our side characters, for lack of a better word. Yes. Um, because that's like a, something that usually the main protagonist struggles with, but instead it was given to everyone fairly to struggle in different ways Mm -hmm. yeah even Mamoru struggles a lot with being isolated he's he's an orphan who lost his parents to uh to a car crash 
and uh, he really struggles with his memories and uh, and things of that nature. Like literally, the only character that's not like a super duper sad sack is uh, is Minako Sailor Venus. That's it, <laughs> and she Minako, even has issues. She... Yeah, she struggles with the fact that she is isolated. I mean, she is because she was doing the Sailor V thing by herself for such a long time. Mm-hmm. That she had to do it all on her own. Uh, that she does long for community, but she herself is powerless in going to find it because it's Usagi who has to connect all these girls. Yes. Like, like there is that. It's just a different flavor of it. Yep. Yep. So we get we get to meet um, Sailor Venus in this iteration when she finally finds relief which they yeah, have never adapted I, I, sailor v into an anime which is interesting hello oh, yeah. oh thank you i have a cucumber salad treat this is good because we're talking about sad things so we're going to eat our feelings you guys thank you so yeah very Jealous. sad welcome in blue thank you so much for joining us today yes you have come back um in the sad part so yeah everyone's sad Sailor Moon Crystal, if you want to, like, the sad to just punch you in the face, Crystal's the best version. Mm, it's really good. Mm. Ooh, jealous. It should be. All right. But the thing is, is that in their isolation, in their melancholy, they do find each other. They mm-hmm. do connect. And they all get superpowers, which makes it worth it, right? Yes. But I want to talk, talk about the superpowers that they don't get by being spirit by being by being uh moon guardians sailor guardians that's the word i was looking for uh but the superpowers that they all already have that aren't that super but exist um what i mean by that is like usagi is the best person to make friends Mm mm-hmm like yes she has that like that super alert of like oh i have this crush on a girl so i want to be her friend sort of thing but the fact that she is so kind and caring and open and loving and just willing to be friends with all of them especially as they sit in their loneliness really does kind of make her superpower of love and justice like it reflects it really well in her real life Mm -hmm. it's so interesting because sailor moon is a big reason why kids that are my age were making Mary Sue's online when we were writing our characters. Sailor Moon was like our, our, our our Mary Sue template. Whereas like, you know, Bella Swan, if you get to go a little later, Bella Swan's the Mary Sue template. Like you get the idea, right? But Sailor Moon was our Mary Sue template. So you would see all these characters online that they're, they're, um, they were clumsy and they couldn't pass school. Right. Uh, And, and that was like their negative traits, but here's the thing. The reason why those Mary Sue characters are annoying, but Sailor Moon is not annoying, is because a lot of those Mary Sue characters don't have Usagi's superpower of making friends. What makes Usagi a great character, despite having so many of the typical late 90s Mary Sue traits, is that Usagi truly, deeply cares about everyone she interacts with. She does nothing but lift everyone else up. She is truly like, she's truly a best friend. She's just, she's really good at being a friend. It's, yeah, a lot of the Mary Sue sort of template have that everyone is attracted to her either like by being her friend or by a relationship or wanting a romantic relationship. Um, and Usagi and but like the Mary Sue cares less about all of the people who dote on her Bella Swan being one of the best examples of this um and Usagi doesn't do that I think the other thing that's important and I know that this doesn't necessarily connect with this her superpower but another thing that makes her different from most Mary Sue's is that we see Usagi struggle uh, a, sh- a struggle and try again and when she tries again she's not automatically good at it we uh, the three seasons are really showing her growth uh and that is a consistent thing she's not just good at it right off the bat mm-hmm. um so i think that that also is something that separates her from all of the women in media that we have been trained to hate <laughs> it's true it's true she's not good at it all of her friends are literally better at being sailor guardians yes. than she is um the only thing she's good at 
is inspiring them to keep coming back over and over. Which is what a leader is. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we love her. Usagi's a great character. She's great. Then we got Amy. And Amy is incredibly good at video games and problem solving. Mm -hmm. Um, She has this superhero or super super power to be able to understand how something works and how to solve the issue, uh, which she then carries over into being a Sailor Scout because she's kind of the person who, where, where Usagi leads, she's the person who directs to like, go there, go there, go there, especially in the original. We saw that a lot where she has her supercomputer and is telling people where exits are and stuff like mm-hmm, that. Mm-hmm. And she's um, great at it. Like what we learned later from um, Sailor Venus is that the video game existed to help train them and help them figure out the basics of fighting before they actually were doing the fighting. And Amy takes to it instantly, even though she's never fought before. That's just like a a, a real display of like how freaking smart she is. Yes. Um, and I think that that really, it's, it's interesting how subtle these highlights of what, who they are and what they're good at resonates into their superhero, uh, life. Because I like to think it's not like Amy's not good at this because she's a sailor scout. She's good at being a sailor scout in that way because this is her natural thing. Or maybe they feed each other, but that's my own, that's my own hot take. No, I totally agree. I totally agree. It kind of, it's the connection between Amy herself and Sailor Mercury. Yes. What makes them be able to exist within the same person. Um, yes. Yep. All right. Ray. Then we got Ray. Uh, Ray has psychic abilities. She is able to see situations and kind of vibe check people as they are. It's like that. It's it's like she has psychic abilities, but it's really her intuition. And she carries that into being a Sailor Scout because she always kind of knows what's up. She always kind of is able to sense the danger. It's like that spidey sense. She's able to sense the danger before it comes there. Uh, it really is that like, uh it, that's the aspect that she brings into it mm-hmm. like at the end of the season she's the one that realizes that like oh we're not done more evil is going to come our way now that the legendary silver crystal is back in the world yes um and it's it's also interesting i love i love ray personally because she's just <laughs> the straight the straight up honest friend that's just like you're being an idiot <laughs> i love that in a girl group <laughs> yes she's awesome uh makoto's cooking that also like connects to her mothering and motherly mm-hmm. sort of aspect of taking care of the other girls she's naturally a caretaker and you see it as she joins the group she's always got food for everybody she's kind of always taking care of Usagi in that motherly way and that transfers over as a sailor scout because she's willing to put herself on the line before anybody else's mm-hmm. uh, she's willing to take the hits first to be the tough to be the tank uh, and is willing to like take all of that on to protect her girls and I think that that's a really cool crossover there yes she's the shield she's the mom she's like the protective bubble you know what I mean so uh yes exactly literally one of her powers (laughs) yeah yeah it is (laughs) you see it you she doesn't have a name for this one but she does it in the manga and in both versions of the anime where Mm -hmm. she can create this bubble that uh floats all the girls around um and makes them fly uh and then we have minako who is the leader naturally usagi bands everybody together but she's not the leader of the scouts she is the person that they are trying to protect because she's prince queen neo queen serenity so she they are supposed to protect her and minako really steps up and is the leader knows how to tell people where to be knows how to like inspire the best out of people Mm -hmm. usagi brings them all together minako teaches them how to be a team Mm -hmm. exactly she's the second in command she is the foil to usagi 
Um, she's doing all of those sorts of things. She's the one that actually helps them revive their memories. She's the first one that has her memories revived. She actually knows what's going on. So if Usagi's ever not there, everyone can turn to Minako and Minako will take over the leadership position. Where Usagi is like their queen, their princess, Minako is the head general. Yes, exactly. Um, And that's kind of how they're all super in their own ways and how really breaking down each of the Sailor Scouts kind of what their tropes are and how they exist and how they relate to each other. Uh, and if you want to do a fun experiment, whenever you go see another magical girl group, uh, you'll probably be able to break it down into these same troops. <laughs> same yes. Tropes. All right. Shall we move on to the next? All right. Yep. Psychic premonitions. All right. So a huge part. Um, I'm just waiting for the slideshow to advance. Oh, sorry. Oh. Oh, no. Okay, hold on one second. There we there go. go. Sorry, okay. I had, there was like an issue with my computer dying. So I had, to sh- I had to change screens. So it should be good. Okay. So a huge part of Sailor Moon is all about psychic premonitions. And this is a big part of uh, Mamoru's character, actually. He has regularly throughout the series dreams about his previous life as King Endymion. And he doesn't really fully understand what these dreams are. All he really knows is that these dreams are pointing him to a legendary silver crystal and a woman. The woman, of course, ends up being, um, excuse me, ends up being Usagi slash Sailor Moon. But um, but he doesn't know that for a long time. Um, true love. Yes, true love. <laughs> and mellage. <laughs> mellage. <laughs> and, uh, and so he has these, these psychic premonition dreams that keep him going forward. And if you can imagine from Memoru's perspective as somebody that doesn't have any family because his parents died when he was very young, so he never had any siblings or anything like that, uh, all he really has is these dreams um, to push him forward and to give him purpose in life. We never find out that uh, Mamoru has any sort of um, career ambitions or anything like that. Career ambitions are, uh, for Mamoru are a purely uh, fandom thing. If you ever find that, it's, it's, it's going to be something that's just part of the fandom. It doesn't really exist in canon. Like all he really mm-hmm. wants to do is protect the legendary silver crystal so that he can one day become King Endymion again. I swear to God, this is one of those things where I was like, didn't he want to be a doctor? <laughs> I don't think so. Just, I thought that was later, later in the original, but that's fine. That's just me. It might be. A fever dream of a memory. I mean, it might be, but as far as I remember from um, the original anime, and I know it's not really in the manga, um, he really doesn't have a lot of career ambitions. You know, he really is just about protecting the legendary silver crystal so that he can one day become King Endymion again and marry Usagi. Mm-hmm. And yeah. First of all, that's an extreme career ambition right there. <laughs> I have my eye on the prize because one day... I'm a be king, bitches. Mm-hmm. Uh, That's true. We no longer are ruled under king and queens here in Japan, but we're bringing it back. <laughs> it's a millennia, y'all. <laughs> yes, that's true. So yeah, even um, even um even uh, the the character, the main character that's not a sailor scout is is subject to these. Yes, and and so many messages and and these past life relationships do happen to some of the girls in their dreams. Uh, and it's it's an interesting concept of how like dream and memory are close to one another, mm. but also adding in there that it's like, okay, your consciousness can let go when it's not focusing on this life, you're able to focus on past lives sort of thing. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Blue, and, and Demian is a, is a popular name in a lot of these types of uh, these shows and things like that. So you'll see it over it's and over. It's because it's a badass name. It is a really badass name. <laughs> <laughs> all right but it's not just him then it's not just him ray gets messages from spirit 
she uh, is able to, again, it's kind of like that vibe check to do with her, but she also gets like straight up messages of like, this terrible thing is happening, fix it, from uh, who, whomever it is that she worships to. Uh, so it is like this interesting, because there's no real religion that exists in in the show. Like you can assume that it's, it's Japan, so it's a lot of the same uh, religions as there, but it's yeah it's like she communicates with spirit and spirit provides uh but is it spirit that's providing or is it like her se- who knows who knows it's a complicated layer <laughs> yeah she she gets premonitions from the fire right yeah so it's kind of implied that this has something to do with uh, shintoism because it is very obviously a shinto shrine that she is a mm-hmm. part of and it's kind of implied that this has something to do with her sailor mars power since uh mars is denoted by fire also, in, uh, in ancient Zoroastrianism, uh, there is a lot of fire worship, and that is a very ancient human religion, one of the oldest human religions. Um, so it is implied that Ray's premonitions come from this very ancient, deeply spiritual place, but it's never explained. Yeah, and and it's also, I, I love that it's never explained, by the way. It doesn't I, need to be. I think it's great that it's never explained. I also think you can throw in there, too, is that Ray, because she is the most psychic of all the girls, and we'll see this, I think, in the later seasons, there is, like, a connection more to her past lives and possibly her future lives than, like, she's more likely to have it than any of the other girls. Um, or at least that was my interpretation of it. But, so it's like always this interesting thing of being like, oh, because she's so hyper-connected to the spirit of, of this, maybe she always is. And so some of these, some messages, of these messages could, could exist, exist because, because of that. Of that. Like, like her, her, her own, own consciousness, consciness connecting, connecting with, with herself, herself every, day, day, every day, 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 whatever. Yeah, I think that um, that is very possible as a, as a theory for how this is happening as well. So. Yep. And then... Again, kind of like we've mentioned it, but it's really directly these past life visions. There are many flashbacks. Uh, um, Momoru gets them. Usagi gets them quite a bit. Uh, Mina get, is known to get them. Uh, Ray gets them. Uh, and it's just memories of who they used to be and how they used to relate to each other. And it's like comes with messages that are necessary to that moment. Mm-hmm. Yep. And it happens to the other girls too. It happens to all of them at one point, whenever towards the end, they're all fighting the four generals. Remember the generals are mind controlled mm-hmm. um, in this and they're all fighting them. And then they realize that, oh, those four generals, um, they used to serve under King and Demian. And we had all these little romances with the the four generals too. And, oh no, now we have to kill them. So sad. <laughs> Can we just talk about like very sad moment? understand why it happens how messy is that friendship like oh my god <laughs> like being oh like, my god i have four friends you have four friends they're all going to date each other and we're all going to hang out and we're in middle school <laughs> so okay so here's the like, thing this is one of the things that does not exist in the original manga but after that part of the manga was written there is artwork depicting the girls and the generals in a romance because Naoko Takuchi um, really lamented the fact that she didn't think like, oh, four and four, I should do more romance. Because Sailor Moon at its core is a romance. It's about the romance of Usagi and Mamoru. So uh, so she really lamented that. So I, I love that it exists in Sailor Moon Crystal. And it's just as awkward as it would have been if Naoko had actually written what she wished she would have written. And you can kind of yes. see why like, oh... Maybe it's good that that didn't exist in the original because it's real awkward. <laughs> Our types are just way too close to each other. Mm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I understand tropes and archetypes exist in friendships for a reason, but man. Four and four. Well, it's like it's like five match with five. Like, wow. That's like, like I'm, wow. Did you Are you dating the male version of yourself or are you dating the male version of one of your friends? Oh, which because that's what's happening here. There's some deep analysis, deep fandom analysis, I think, that could go on between like which Sailor Scout is dating which of the Earth generals um, compared to who they're most actually like. Yeah. Yes. Also, like recognizing that I'm talking as a 28 year old. Nine and ten year old me would have been all over this shit. Oh, I was all (laughs) over it. I, I shipped this shit so hard. I was like. 
man, yeah. why wasn't this in the original manga? Naoko totally should have written it in. They should have added it to the anime. Oh my God, what the heck? You know? Um, I yeah. <laughs> I could see it. I was all about um, it. All about it. But speaking of our favorite generals, let's talk about the theme that even more than sadness parades like the entirety of this season. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's like a single episode that goes without it. No, I don't think so either. Every episode has at least a little bit of this. What is it? Mind (laughs) control. control. Sailor Moon (laughs) loves mind control. Loves it. There's zombies in this. There's like um, people that are compelled to do certain acts. Uh, they turn Mamoru evil for a while. Like no yes. one escapes the mind control. No one. And I, and I like knew that there was a lot of mind control. I remember evil. I remember evil uh, Mamoru from the original. Uh, I remember there's like a Sailor Moon movie, like that was based off of the original anime that mind controlled a bunch of children to go to like a dreamland yeah (laughs) Uh, like i knew mind control played a large part of it holy shit (laughs) does it it just exists everywhere in the first season uh and it's like wow no wonder i've always been scared that someone's going to mind control me Uh, again (laughs) the little eight-year-old in me is just like wow you can talk and then make people do what you want them to do so cool (laughs) yeah blue you're totally right um this show absolutely spawned some serious obsessions with mind control and i mean this is another reason why i'm like i think why i think sailor moon crystal actually is a good introduction to sailor moon for people who have not seen it before because if you watch other versions of sailor moon and even if you read the manga it's not quite as overt the amount of times mind control as used as the evil thing is like absolutely fucking bonkers ridiculous. It's like, it just hits you over the head with it. Like mind control, mind control, mind control. So let's talk about like why that is. Why, why is yeah. mind control so scary for a teenage girl? Maybe it's because we are literally forced to do what we don't want to do as soon as a woman starts becoming a sexual being. So somewhere around like your preteen and early teen years, guess what? You're going to start to have hormones and you're going to start to want to do sexy things and feel sexy and be sexy with other people. It's kind of just what happens to all humans. And I don't know if you guys remember, because we as collectively as a society, we like to pretend that we forget this, but there's like a year where all the, the girls in middle school are horny and none of the boys have caught up and they still think girls have cooties. Like there's like a moment where girls are already mature and the boys are not yet. And so, but the girls are the ones that are pushed to be chaste in our society, not the boys. So from this time, when we're very young, we're told we have to dress a certain way. We have to act a certain way. We have to say certain things so that we can be accountable to other people's actions. So it is no wonder that in season one, when Usagi and her friends are around 15, 16 years old, this is the scariest thing they can imagine. This is their enemy. This is the tactic their enemy keeps using on them. Mind control. Yep. I I also think that they're like not only is it a societal thing but there's also a powerlessness to it and and yes it has to do with like being chased in our society to tell women to be chased but it also has to do with like the struggle of those teen years of becoming an adult within society of like your teenage brain is developing into something that can function in normal society uh, but you're still a child. Like you're still not there to do it. Your decision making has not been turned on yet. That frontal pr- cor- prefrontal cortex doesn't exist. <laughs> yep. But there's other things um, in your brain that have developed. So like you think it's there, but it's not there yeah. yet. <laughs> and it's it's like a level of like, I'm an adult. And so we have a show where young girls are risking their lives and bodies to protect other people, doing adult things. Um, 
they're doing adult things, protecting other people, but there's a powerlessness to it because they still aren't adults. They still don't get to control what is happening to them. Uh, and so like that idea of what is the ultimate thing to like still give women power, but also make them powerless, that's literally taking the power away from them without taking how powerful they are away. And that's mind control. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Literally sitting there and being like, oh yeah, you are awesome. And you have all these super skills, but man, you fail, you fail this one moment. You're not going to be able to do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yep. And I love, I just love this theme. I love this theme in Sailor Moon. I think it is so appropriate for the age of the characters and um and it's just part of what makes me love this early part of Sailor Moon so much. I think it's it's one of those early theme, it's one of those themes that people don't catch on to until they really excuse me, until they really start thinking about it, until you're like doing a show like this or you're really like analyzing it that you don't think about why it universally resonates. But it does universally resonate. Yeah. Mind control is a terrible is a terribly scary thing for a lot of young kids and that's like it's a scary thing because of x y and z Mm -hmm. uh, all the things that we've talked about but you don't really know that and most people don't really understand it no you don't really think about it you don't think about it until you're like oh wait i have to take notes while i'm watching this (laughs) you're like why it's like that same thing of being like oh i'm scared of the creepy thing under my bed even though i know nothing's under my bed it's because things used to be under your bed when you were a cave person, right? Like it's that same intense, irrational fear of mm-hmm. you are still scared someone is going to take away your bodily autonomy and your auto- your autonomy to be who you are. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And mind control is the same thing. It's the same um, it same manifestation of that just for uh, a teenage girl. Yes. Yes. So <clears throat> uh, universal woman's experience as far as like being afraid of mind control and Sailor Moon wraps it up perfectly. Mm -hmm. Uh, And there's a lot of it. So if you're like interested in mind control, watch Sailor Moon or any anime, literally any anime. Yeah, especially from this time period of 90s and early 2000s. Yeah. (laughs) All right. So that brings us to the question. Did Did season one of Sailor Moon Crystal resonate? Okay. So there's a lot of hate out there for season one. You'll see a lot of Sailor Moon fans saying, oh, you know, all these problems get better in season two and season three. I'm here to tell you, season one still resonates, okay? It's still an excellent version of Sailor Moon. Um, Does it have some serious flaws? Absolutely. Is it pretty clear that the main motivation for creating it was money? Yes. However... (laughs) it still resonates. It is still an excellent introduction to the series. It still has all of the piece parts that are really make um, Sailor Moon so magical. It still has all of the things in it that make it a great tool for, uh, for children to play. They can be each of the Sailor Scouts. It still has a lot of stuff in it that is genuinely scary and resonates in that way in the series to where kids are going to be attracted to it and watching it as an adult, you're going to have a lot that you can take out of it as well. So yes, for me, even Sailor Moon Crystal Season 1, which is considered one of the worst Sailor Moonish things ever adapted, it still resonates and it's still excellent. I love it. Um, so what about you, Landon? Does it resonate with you? Listen, I don't like anime. I like this show. It's good. It's awesome. It's fantastic. Even it's entertaining. I think it's a a quick watch. Uh, It brought nostalgia back to me. I think that there are interesting lessons to learn. I think that there are parts of it that were a little slow, uh, but it made me really excited to watch season two and season three. Um, As far as the themes that existed, isolation, uh, melancholy, the idea of mind control and like what the deeper meanings of that were, those all resonated to my personal experience, as well as like the idea of, of like how I want media to represent real life. Uh, And am I interested in writing a Sailor Moon fan fiction? I absolutely am. So yeah, it resonated. (laughs) Yeah, for sure. (laughs) 
Blue, we have not discussed Oron yet, and um, you know what? We we might should do an episode on Oron. Maybe maybe at some point when we do another anime, I'll suggest Oron. You have not seen that one, have you, Landon? Oh, I didn't realize it was an anime. I was just like, Oron, that sounds fun. It's an anime. Okay, well, Oron High School Host Club. Oron High School Host Club. Maybe someday we'll do that one. Oh yeah, I've seen that shit. No, that's not true. I haven't seen that shit. I read that. I read the manga. Oh, okay. So you're familiar a little bit with Oran. Maybe we'll watch the anime version of it. So yes, okay. we love Sailor Moon. Um, we think it's great. I, I, I've i never watched a version of Sailor Moon that I didn't get something out of. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's just good. It's just good, you guys. <laughs> it makes me want to go back and rewatch like some of my favorite movies from Sailor Moon. Mm-hmm. Like, from Sailor Moon. I cannot remember which one it is, but there's one with plants and an alien boy that yeah there's I, that's all I can tell you about it and I, I loved think that it. One, I watched it 50 times <laughs> I think that one is Sailor Moon R maybe I know which one you're talking about and like he has a sister and they're like plant people yeah. and they're trying to and do this thing with a tree yeah and him and and him and Damien are really close yes and they were best friends growing up and I was just like bros just want to be bros <laughs> yeah I I love it I want to go back and watch that movie where I'll find it I don't know someone tore it for it, it for me <laughs> if it's anywhere it's probably on Hulu I, I would say that they have probably. the biggest library of that sort of thing but yeah we love Sailor Moon um we we love it so much and guess what you guys this was just part one of a multi-part Sailor Moon series. Next week, we're going to be talking about Sailor Moon Crystal Season 2. So if you want to hear about um, Usagi, a little bit of a more deep dive into her character, some of the complaints about her character in general that exist across multiple versions of Sailor Moon, we're going to get into it. We're going to get into it when we talk about Season 2, because that's the Chibiusa season. This is this is when I'm going to start having a big old fat crush on some characters. Uh, so just be prepared from here on out. <laughs> mm. <laughs> yes. And I'm just like, wow, you're such a badass. I love you so much. <laughs> yep. So if you would like to see that, please make sure you are following my Twitch. Um, if you would like to watch us live, um, if you are watching on YouTube, hello. Hey, YouTube, what's up? Uh, go subscribe down below and because uh, that will be posted once we do the uh, the stream of that. Um, I also stream on Thursday, so if you're interested in just me by myself, that is called Artistic License. I stream Thursdays from 6.30 to 8.30. We're playing Riven right now. We played it last week. We're going to do it um, again next week. I've got, you know, it's a it's the sequel to Mist, so you guys know. I got notes, okay? I got notes for Riven. Um, we got a little notebook here with all of our things in it. Oh, look, Denis numbers. Yeah. So if you like puzzle games, you should definitely come watch my Riven playthrough. Um, that's going to be right here on Twitch as well. Uh, I also, uh, my main social media is, uh, is Twitter. So if you always want to be kept up to date on all the things that I'm doing and, uh, and on all of that, you want to follow the Twitter. If you want to make sure that you get notifications without missing any, you want to join my discord. Cause I actually can control the notifications in there. Um, that's also a nice way to chat with me. And, uh, and we do some writing and role play help and things like that as well. So if you have questions, we can help you out. Um, so yeah, that's all the things. That's where you can find me. Landon, where can everybody find you? Uh, you can find me at Land in Maine. It's a pun on uh, Instagram and Twitter. Uh, buy my book. I have a book on Amazon. It's under Landon Bowers, uh, Around the World and Back Again, a collection of poems from here, there, and everywhere. Uh, I'm on a writing kick. So uh, there's going to be a lot of like writing stuff on both of those platforms for right now. Yes. No, Blue, we have not finished Final Fantasy X. We've still got lots of optional bosses to beat, but we're doing, we're taking a break and doing Riven since I, you know, I just moved in a new set and everything. Speaking of Final Fantasy, uh, you'll never guess what I'm playing, Karen. What are you playing? I'm playing Kingdom Hearts. (gasps) What? (laughs) Y'all didn't know Landon does play a few video games. (laughs) It's literally two. It's Kingdom Hearts (laughs) and it's Sims. That's basically it. Uh, but I started because I, I have two more weeks. Sorry, I have one, one more week off of school. And so I was like, I should do something fun. And I was like, I'll play through Kingdom Hearts. So that's what I'm doing with my time these days. Well, Kingdom so Hearts is fun. very inspiring, especially the first one. Um, yeah. I, I kind of, I kind of fall out of it after that because it gets too complicated and silly for me. But, um, but I love the Perfect. first Kingdom Hearts a lot. Uh, and I do find it very inspiring. It is fun, and because I played it so much as a youth and now, uh, I can 
like basically have it on very quiet and then watch other things in the background while I keep my hands busy. Mm. And it's fantastic mm-hmm. <laughs> for my Blue ADHD. Wants to, I love it. Blue wants to know why Kingdom Hearts. Why are you drawn to that game? Uh, I like literally Disney. Second of all, um, I played it as a kid. With I remember. <laughs> Me, my brother, and my dad, we didn't have a lot of time together when I was growing up. Uh, and so over summers, we would just, like, literally stay up for, like, 24 hours a couple days in a row and beat Kingdom Hearts games. So we did that for Kingdom Hearts 1 and Kingdom Hearts 2. Uh, and eventually, uh, we all separately played Kingdom Hearts 3. So that was a lot of fun. I love that. What a nice story. Yes. Hello. All right, you guys. So let's go ahead and I'm going to find someone to raid. Um, While I'm doing that, I just want to say thank you guys so much for joining us today. Um, I love Sailor Moon. I'm really excited that we got to share it with all of you. Um, It's one of the, it's one of the, I, I think like quintessential pieces of media in, in my life. You know what I mean? Um, It's, it's something that I loved as a kid and I have never, stopped loving right so uh so it's very near and dear to my heart oh guess what speaking of kingdom hearts our friend lady sushi is playing kingdom hearts hd 1.5 plus 2.5 remix obviously we have to we obviously we have to raid into lady sushi (laughs) okay let's get that going let's see what she's doing she is i can't tell what part of the game that she's on it looks towards the beginning i don't know it's just it's just the dude fighting Heartless. That's Roxas? I think it's Roxas fighting some like little oh, tiny little she's, she's on 2.5 two, then. Can I finish 1.5? Okay. All right. You would know more about that one than I do. Okay. All right, you guys. We're going to go ahead and raid into Lady the Sushi. One thing. <laughs> yes. All right, you guys. Um, thank you so much for watching. I will see you next week. And um, don't forget, of course, as always, to make it a great day. Don't, don't forget to be awesome. awesome. Bye, y'all. Bye.